Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, Chavarim. Shalom. Let's talk about Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben Yohanan, or as he would say, Jokinen. Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben. So one of the best books, I want to point this out right here, one of the best books from Dr. Ben, the apostate. He was an apostate Jew. He was a, he was a black Jew that fell off. It's almost like when we say you know, some say about European Jews, even European Jews, they use certain terminology about ones that are not really practicing. Maybe we can call them like what, Chaloni, like secular, secular Jews or, or, or crypto. You might have heard this term crypto. Some of you use the Luciferian Jews, so forth and so on. But we also have the same thing with us as Israelites, as the Bait Yisrael, Beta Israel. You know, not just in Ethiopia, there's a beta Israel of Ethiopia, the black Jews of Ethiopia. But here we're speaking for we, the black Jews of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Here, especially in the Americas and the Caribbean, right? Caribbean, the trans-Ethiopian ocean slave trade. Yes, 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 yes. So here, 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 let's talk a little bit about Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben Yohanan. Now there's some... Um, there's some history concerning him and his family when they came from Ethiopia um, and why even they may have been kicked out of Ethiopia. Not going to seek to address that, but first of all, let's address his best book, right, that some in the comedic community are seeking to debunk. And it's this particular book right here, We the Black Jews. Just was hearing a little bit of a... Uh, JJ 7000, the hot seat, and he mentioned this, and then Sarnetta, <laughs> um, what's his name, Frank, Frankie or whatever, but the one who called himself Sarnetta, he sought to debunk it with a Dr. Ben uh, video, a lecture, where he basically says, all you who are black Jews and African Israelites and so forth and so on, you know, you ain't she, you know, he was like, basically, you ain't shit. Basically, he became very Americanized on a certain level. By we black people over here, you know, many of them. Well, we'll touch on that as well. But first of all, his best book. So we're going to call this We the Black Jews, right? The truth, right? Here we get the truth from an apostate. Apostate, what does apostasy mean? Apostasy means that you fall away or you, you go away, you know, you go away, like from the path, you fall off, right? Now, for many others, Dr. Ben did not fall off, you know, they embrace fully, you know, especially his, um, quote, comedic, you know, his comedic, his comedicism. You know, they embrace fully. And we understand exactly why. It's very important, you know, for us to know these things that we have not gotten to know. As we share this right here, Dr. Ben's best book, We the Black Jews. So in spite of Dr. Ben, um, after he produced this book, and we just have to do some more research. Because we're just coming in contact with certain information. We came in contact with other information where Dr. Ben Yohanan... Right, speaking of this man right here, 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 but he says Jokinen. Now notice his name is Yosef Ben. You see, where in English it says Jokinen, right? It's really from the Hebrew Yohanan, Yosef Ben Yohanan. But you'll never, almost never hear him say his name as Yohanan. Now, got to also learn this, you know, from the comedic community. It said that he had a his father, you know, married a Puerto Rican woman, and basically his mother is a Puerto Rican. So I'm not too sure whether she was a Catholic, not too sure about the practice of um, Yehudinet, as from an Ethiopian perspective, Yehudinet, or what's called Judaism, you know, in his family, what the practice was. Because, see, to be of a lineage, to be of a seed is one thing. Right. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. This is how we respond from a, yes, a scriptural perspective but something that Dr. Ben said in another lecture at the beginning of a lecture that we've seen, Dr. Ben. Some of y'all who are, you know, Dr. Ben, Yohananites, Jokinites, those who are Jokinites, especially on the Kemeticism. But notice it is a black Jew of Ethiopia right, that first seemed to embrace but then, in a sense, forsook, right, his, we could say, his, his, his cultural identity. See, this is a cultural identity, Ethiopian cultural identity, right, black, Jewish, Hebrew, Israelite identity in favor, you know, of, we could say, 
his Egyptology and Egyptology from a pro-black perspective. You know, he goes on the whole thing of what is older. So here we're going to have to use a double-edged sword, right? Because many brothers, you know, and sisters, you're going to encounter this as you encounter certain comedics. They're going to say, well, Dr. Ben, he, he, he dis, um, you know, he disavowed the book or he disavowed that or, or, or like he changed his mind later on. The facts in this particular book, We the Black Jews, still remain facts. I just want to point that out. The facts that are in this particular book still remains facts. But here's the key thing. Right? There's a few key things that we notice with Dr. Ben. And it shouldn't be surprising from an Israelite or Hebrew perspective. It's not a surprising to us because in the lecture that we just mentioned, um, at least we mentioned the lecture, but we're seeking to recall the name. This was some um, maybe 10 to 20, about 20 or so years ago, we saw this lecture on the YouTubes. And we need to go through many of the different available lectures of Dr. Ben to find it. But some of y'all might know it. If you know it, hit it up in the chat um, or Rastafari Jews at, at, at gmail.com. Just hit us up right there because we get to check some of the comments, sometimes not all of the comments, you know what I mean? Because of the various levels of um, of duty, responsibility, and some of the works, you know, but we definitely say link us up. We do check our email, you know, more regularly, you know, but hopefully if the comment is there, you know, we will find that comment, you know, just to know where this particular, what, if you know the name of this video. Anyway, the video with Dr. Ben, he comes on the stage, he's introduced, and Dr. Ben comes on the stage, and he says something to the effect of, um, I think Salam or Salamta and or Tena Yistalin. I think he says, yeah, he says, he says, I think he says Tena Yistalin. He says Tena Yistalin, Tena Yistalin, Tena Yistalin. You might hear it as Tena Yistalin. Now, what does Tena Yistalin mean? He says, these are the only two words. He says at the beginning of this lecture, uh, you know, something comedic, pro-black, Egyptology. You know, he begins off the lecture by giving a greeting. He said, this is an Ethiopian greeting, right? He says, this is an Ethiopian greeting. Remember, Ethiopia is at the root of the whole Nile Valley um, civilization. It's the root. Even the ancient um, Smaitawians, you know, also called Kemetiu, you know, or Egyptians, they understood that the Ethiopia land was the Kui land, was the land of the gods land. Even Dr. Ben, he goes into that. So there's a lot of accuracy into, you know, a lot of the research, but his opinions, you know, there's two things that a researcher does. First of all, a researcher or scholar, you know, gathers together certain facts or points of reference and evidence and information, and then seeks to connect it with the interpretation of these things, you know, the interpretation, you know, of the information. So it is not Dr. Ben's scholarship, especially in this book right here. This book is a pivotal book, right? It's interesting because actually this particular book, We the Black Jews, witnessed the white Jewish race myth. On this level, Dr. Ben was proving and proving and he was disproving. He was proving that black people are the original, you know, especially even concerning the Israelite biblical heritage, Basically, in a sense, he cut himself on a certain level when later on he sought to disprove, as in the video that Sonetta had played, you know, when JJ 7000 was seeking to bring forward this book, you know, and bring forward, I think there's an audible out there concerning this particular book. So what Dr. Ben is going on is on the scholarship and the academic, you know, the academic, um, what he's learned in the academia. But in the video that we are seeking to get the name of where he says, um, we the black Jews. Oh, in that particular video that we don't know the name of, the video that we don't know the name of, but it's at the beginning of the video. All you comedics out there, all you Dr. Benites, your Yakinites, and this is not no disrespect or nothing like that, just saying that those who are really into Dr. Ben's, you know, video, some ones and ones really study it. So they probably, no doubt, will know this particular you know, clip that we are pointing to where Dr. Ben says, and then he says, these are the only two um, Amharic or Ethiopian, we could even say Afro-Semitic, 
And they're Afro-Semitic. When you speak about Afro-Semitic, another proof that the Israelite heritage, the biblical heritage, even the language of a Hebrew, Hebraic heritage is Afro-Semitic, is Afro-Semitic. And we see Afro, that is connecting with the African, right? That African. So even the, the language proves, right? Even the language of the Bible proves that it's African. Now note, this is Yadin right here, Ross I Adonis making this point, L-O-J making this point. Many ones are gonna pick up on this and we hear other ones picking up on other points that we made and sometimes articulating it well, even better than we did and even building on it. So give thanks, this is another point that ones have to build up on that to prove that the biblical, the true biblical heritage is an African tradition from its root. I'm not talking about all that has gone on over the past 400 years. You know, when our people proverbially lost their minds or from a biblical perspective, you know, um, fell under the curse. So we'll say the consequence of disobedience. And we see this in Dr. Ben as well. Right. And some would say it would hurt them to say this. It doesn't really hurt us to say this, but we have to use a double edged sword in saying this. You know, it says it cut when it goes in, it cuts when it comes out. Because when Dr. Ben said that Tenayistalin, Tenayistalin are the only two, you know what I mean? He said, Salamta Tenayistalin. How do you say that? No, he said Tenayistalin, right? It's the only one or two words. I got to get this clip again. Because what's interesting, he said, these are the only words that he knows how to speak, right? In an Afro-Shemitic language. And also Dr. Ben, for the Kemites, also know this. Um, this is proven, I think it's in a video where Dr. Ben says that no one really can speak the Metuneter, the Metuneter, you know, or read it. He almost inferred that, all this Metuneter, you know, the sacred language of the monuments and the tombs and of the Metunet of the Per in Peru, as they call it, um, the sacred, the, the God language, the sacred language, that nobody can read it. Nobody can. It hasn't been deciphered. He claimed in a video that it could not be read, it could not be deciphered, and that basically that what all that has been spoken of might not even be accurate because how do we know what the ancients were writing on those monuments? And for Dr. Ben, a great teacher of this to say, I think this is also in his later years, right, that nobody has deciphered it. It has not been deciphered. Nobody can read it. And then on the other hand, to also admit that even as a black Jew, a beta Israel, you know, of Ethiopia, some would refer as the Falashas, which means like exiles of Ethiopia, coming from that ancient heritage, that black African witness, that he does not know language. Now, we have to pause on this because this is a big point for a scholar. Now, doesn't mean he cannot be a good scholar based on other people's research and other people's interpretation, other people's translations, but he could never... Right, besides his own opinionated opinion, might discern or explain whether it's true or whether it's not because he did not possess that linguistic faculty. And this is one of the most shocking things that we got to learn about Dr. Ben later on. This does not dismiss all of his great scholarship, his, his compilation. I think he was an excellent compiler and a regurgitator of what he compiled as well as you know, how can we say a blackifier? <laughs> to say a blackifier, you know what I mean? Where he emphasized, you know, the the ethnic, you know, we can even somebody say even the racial connection of ancient history in ancient Egypt and ancient um Smai Tawi, Kemet, uh a Tameri, another name as well, Tameri and also Ethiopia to a less significant extent. I got to point that out because he mentioned, you know, in various interviews that, yes, he is a black Jew or he comes from that heritage because his father and his people are beta Israel of Ethiopia, but that him being, I think, born over here or his Puerto Rican mother and his family life outside in the real exile. See, 
though they call the Beta Israel Falasha, which means exileless in the sense of being in the South land and not being in the North land, like the state of Israel land, the real exile was over here because Dr. Ben never got to learn those things that, you know, that really helps one to build on their heritage. But yes, he did claim that because that was a strong part of his, um, his CV, you know, his, um, curriculum vitae, his resume, so to speak, Yosef Ben Jokinen. This is why I was amazed when people keep saying Jokinen, Jokinen, Jokinen. And yet we know that in the Hebrew, right, this will be Yohanan, 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 or in a later Amharic sense, Yohannes or something like that, Yo Yohan, Yohan, Yohanan. He says, a master teacher with a forceful command of ancient and contemporary history. He was a historian. He was going over the history and he was saying that our black history, just generally speaking as black people, can be testified as being very old and very ancient. And what he did is prove that the ancient Egyptians, the original Egyptians, were Ethiopian black people. And what he also proved is that the Hebrews and the Israelites and the Jews, the Yehudim, also were black people originally. This is what he proved. So if later on he says basically that he, he doesn't practice the faith, he don't care about the faith, and to him he regards as not being shit, how many Jews, right, just generally speaking, and mostly we'll be speaking nowadays about um, European Jews or Ashkenazi Jews or popular Jews of today, how many of them also say they're Jews, but they might not ascribe, right, to the Torah? They're not, they're more secular Jews. So Dr. Ben was, 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 was secular, right? He admitted to being secular. He also admitted that he did not have a grasp, right, of the Ethiopian languages, didn't have a grasp of the Hebrew, but more importantly, did not have a grasp of the ancient Kemetic, Right? Because he said that the Medunetar, the Medunetar, right, the language of the gods, the sacred language of the monuments and all that could not be deciphered. The Metu Ra'en Komet Kamt, right, could not be deciphered or was not deciphered. He cast some great doubt. I remember when that point was brought up, there was to be a lecture, I think, with um, Sarasut and Sati and, and young Pharaoh. Well, this will be some lecture. I think I forget who they were lecturing against, but they pulled out of the lecture and they were dropping that particular clip all over the place where Dr. Ben basically said that the that the ancient Egyptian um, Metuneta has not been deciphered. But he admitted that him himself was not a decipherist. So he dismissed all of the former deciphering. So this is kind of the confusion. But remember, this is also was said in Dr. Ben's later years, too. Uh, we, we have to, you know, you know, keep it right and accurate, right? And we know Dr. Ben was a man, right? And, you know, he was mortal, you know what I mean? And he also had his own, how can you say, personal, you know, issues, I like many ones have personal issues like I because I'm a black American. I'm a so-called African-American, but I might have certain issues with other black Americans, African-Americans about certain things that are important to us. We have different points of view and we disagree. But when push comes to shove and as Marcus Messiah Garvey said, when our backs is against the wall, we'll recognize the common denominator. Right. There's a common denominator. So, yes. Dr. Ben said that in a lecture. He said that if you call you all y'all who are proud or call yourself black Jew or African Jew or Hebrew or blah, 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 that ain't shit. He was like, that ain't shit, you know? And he went on to the so-called Abrahamic face. Because you have to remember in academia, in the minimalist view of Egyptology, that was coming into vogue in the 70s. This is when Dr. Ben comes into it. This is why we showed um, another video um, where we did a lecture. I don't know if we had shared that video just yet. It was about, I don't know if we can find the book right here at hand where we are, right in the King's Chamber right here, if we can find that particular book. But it's a book 
about um, the Egyptian Exodus. Let's see if we can pause for a moment and bring that book up because it's a very important book because it basically proves, goes to show and prove, right, that something changed in the academic, in the academic institutions, like all from, we could say, the turn of the, the 20th century, right, coming through, especially, like, say, the, the 40s to roughly the 70s, there was one view of the academics and scholarship concerning ancient Egypt, you know, and concerning the Bible and concerning the evidence that they were finding that was a pro-Israelite Hebrew exodus. But then in the 70s, some things were changing in the 1970s. Now, people say, well, that's because they found such and such and such and such and such. No, they had found such and such and such way earlier. Some would claim that it's because the evidence on the ground was not proving what, you know, what, you know, what the Bible is saying. But actually what was going on was that among the European-led academics in scholarship, general scholarship that Dr. Ben was a part of or became a part of, there was a, a shift taking place, right? There was a shift. It was called a minimalist, a minimalist shift. We'll get into a little bit more on that because ones think that, you know, if you're not really into the academic thing, the academics is a gang too. They call it consensus. There was a different consensus that was coming in, especially when we look at it around the time of the 70s, you know, the 70s consensus that was coming. In. It's kind of interesting is that when they was trying to say that ancient Egypt was, some was trying to popularly say that it was white or infer that it was white with the mummy movies and the Cleopatra movies and Hollywood and the Moses movie, when they were trying to claim to the popular public that it was white, right? <laughs> they were acknowledging that, yes, this is factual. This is real. But as soon as black people started to rise up in their consciousness and identify with being black Jews, with being Hebrews and Israelites, the academic consensus shifted. It did a virtually a 180, 180 degree flip. Right. So we get into the late 60s, coming into the 70s. Remember, at this time, we get a black is beautiful, black power, pro black. And a lot of black people in different ways were identifying black heritage and ancient culture. And there were many ones who were identifying with the Hebrew and with the Israelite. Right. And with the, quote, so-called black Jewish identification. Right. Whether as Hebrews or Israelites, there was different movements. And we know this from the Dr. Ben, you know, um, you know, um, from from Ben Ami Carter. I want to say Ben, another Ben. Ben means son. Ben Ami Carter, you know, and with the, the African Israelites of Demona, even with the Yahweh Ben Yahweh movement. These were the overt movements. These were the overt, these were like the popular, the big, the mega, you know, they had the mega churches. These were like the more like the mega Israelite, the bigger Israelite movements or the ones that had more prominence in media. Now, in his book, to give due credit where credit is due, in this book, he compiles a wealth of historical information. This is one thing that Dr. Ben was good at. We don't want to have this video sound like, okay, we do, we, you know, we're talking about his book, like thumb upping his book and thumbing him down. No. But as far as his opinion later on in his later days where he says that being a black Jew or Israelite, you know, if you he didn't say that there was no such thing. He was just saying that, well, Egypt and Kemet is older, is older. Does older always mean better? Let me ask one of that question right here. Just a logic question, just a reasoning question. Does 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 older mean better? Mm hmm. And, and, and let's hear the hypocrisy. Right? We want to hear the hypocrisy of our people. What do we mean by the hypocrisy of our people? The hypocrisy of our people is that we'll make it seem like older, right, is better. But yet we'll say, oh, those are the old men. You are old man, the old woman, the elders, you know, and the elders have misled us. Look how the youth talk about the elders. Not, not all, not all, not all. But look how there's that dichotomy. There's, there's that two sides of it we're the younger. Why do we go through our teenage years, so to speak? Why do we go through our rebellious years, right? And sometimes we continue down that path. Other times we begin to recognize, you know, I now have experience because the young people, they lack wisdom. Young people lack wisdom. 
You know, young people lack wisdom. How can they know it? Right? It's something that his imperial majesty says right here, here, here. That the youths, they lack, they lack wisdom. Right? You know, they lack wisdom. So, so they'll be uncouth. There are uncouth ways of the youth. Why? Because the youth lack wisdom. That means that the elders can talk and talk and talk and talk and can try to give the young people the best, you know, parables and wisdom, you know, you know, wisdom keys and all of that and everything like that. And the young people, hopefully the young people do like a lot of us did. A lot of us heard what the elders said to us when we were young, but we never really, you know, we couldn't know it, right? But some of us were at least, this is why they taught the young people like respect. You know why they taught the young people respect? What they taught the young people respect because when I say respect is like respect your elders. So like when your elder is speaking to you, you know what I'm saying? When your elder is speaking to you, Dr. Ben, you know, and he had a he had an issue, you know, with his imperial majesty because it is alleged that his his father, right, speaking of Dr. Ben's father and perhaps some others, were exiled, were kicked out of Ethiopia. Now there's questions about the reasons why. I don't know whether it was a traitorous, you know, or treasonous actions, you know, that were taking place, but for some reason, right, or being a spy or whatnot. I'm just gonna point this out because it needs to be understood. So when you hear some of his like even in the same book, We the Black Jews, right? And even other books, on one level he kind of points to his majesty complimentarily Right. But then sometimes we'll turn around and would have like a, a, a personal, you know, like when somebody like, for example, we're speaking about Dr. Ben. We just want to speak about the evidence, the facts, not the personal thing. We don't want to develop a personal thing with him. So on his strong points and the true points, we want to say, yay in our main, whether it's his research about ancient Egypt from a, as a historian, right, as a historian. But here, the impatience is a fact Right, right here it says, it says right here, it is a fact that young people have always been impatient. This international movement is therefore not surprising. The words of the king of kings, you know, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the king of Israel, according to his anointing and coronation, witnessed by 72 nations. Such movements sometimes bring useful ideas into the open, but very often these ideas turn out to be harmful and contrary to ordinary progress. This impatient here, the king of kings, right? The conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David is speaking on young people. I want you to hear this, brothers and sisters. This impatience and agitation, because we're going through the same thing now, even in social media. This impatience and agitation result in large part from a misunderstanding of realities, a misunderstanding of realities. We are convinced that young people must learn to use their heads rather than their fists. They should be heard, but also guided for the common good. Now, here's the part. Young people will be young people. You cannot change the uncouth manners of the youth. Besides, there is nothing new in that. There is never anything new under the sun. They can they can't know it. Get this right here. Here's the part. They can't know it. Speaking about the youths. And when we all are young, we can't know it because it says they lack, they lack experience. They can't know it because they lack experience. When we're young, right, we hear the elders tell us something, right? And sometimes we don't understand what they're saying, right? You know, but, but we hear it and we respectful and we heard them. You heard what I said to you, boy? It's like, yes, you said such and such. Yeah, that's good. Make, make sure you remember. I know you don't understand what I'm saying. Sometimes they even told us, we didn't understand what they were saying then, but later on, you know, like God willing, we would, right? They can't know it because they lack experience. They lack wisdom, wisdom, right? Wisdom is justified by all of her children, wisdom. We can say almost like the divine mother, right? Wisdom, they lack wisdom. Examine the past. You'll see that the disobedience of the young has occurred all through history. The young don't know what they want. <laughs> Life is like a, the theater. One mustn't try to understand it all at once and immediately. It is no longer amusing. There are good men and wicked. 
the former should be made use of and the latter punish without attempting to understand why the ones are good and the others wicked. We demand too much of men to be able to respect them. You know, yeah, to respect them. And that's interesting because respect is we to honor the brotherhood. You know, we to honor the brotherhood, right? We to honor, honor, you know, honor, right? Honor, honor thy brother, right? Honor, right? Now, we to, we to respect and reverence the almighty power, right? The logic of logics. That which man dreams of and to which he aspires, unless fulfilled in his own lifetime, can produce no actual satisfaction to him. It will be self-deceiving and a waste of time to advocate dialogue with those who are not ready to listen, because it is obvious that the freedom of millions is not a commodity subject to bargaining. It is better to die free than to live as slaves. You know, you must be born again. And the only way to be born again, think about it for a moment, right? Before one can be born again, one has to die. You know what I'm saying? So let's get to this again right here, Dr. Ben. So Dr. Ben, you know, his heritage is his heritage. He's the Ethiopian, generally speaking, more specifically, a beta Israel. He is of Israel. But as the word says, Right, not who all who are of Israel are Israel. For example, let's look at Abraham. Right, we have Abraham had Yishmael, but according to the covenant, right, it goes to Yitzhak, right, and Isaac, right, and Ribka and Rebecca, right. They had what? Rebecca had those those twins, right? Esau, Esau, and Jacob. So Esau is naturally. Right, connected to Yitzhak is his father, and Abraham is his grandfather, right? But in the spirit, the spirit and the truth, he goes off. Esau is an apostate, right? And see, we didn't have to even get into the black and white thing because the true context of the scripture was not even pointing to that from the carnal mind, it was pointing out the spiritual, right? The spiritual, or let's put it the figurative. Right. Even on a higher level, the psycho spiritual, the scientific level of it, that just because one is naturally. So he is naturally a black Jew. Right. But spiritually, psychologically, he became more and more alienated. You know, what I mean, it, like when when Rabbi Shaul, Rabbi Saul, who the world called the Apostle Paul, he speaks of ones like this right here. Right? That's why a lot of ones, even ones who you would think, wait, but he's a Jew. It's like you might meet even Jews today right, who are secular Jews. They hold to being a Jew because they look at the Jew like in the sense that we should look at Judah, Yehuda, and the tribe of Judah as being a lineage that we descend from. Right. You know, they look at it as a lineage or they've been practicing this religion so long amongst them as a set of people. They identify it from more secular terms or more natural terms. But they dismiss, you know, the the words of the of their elders. Right. To say the Bible, the Torah and the scripture. And the same thing did Dr. Ben. But I think Dr. Ben is a little bit different being a black Jew who's like a secular Jew, you know, or even they call them crypto Jews. And a lot has to do with his background. A lot has to do with his parent. A lot, one even can say, may have to do with his father. A lot also may have to do with the fact that his father was allegedly kicked out of Ethiopia for some reason. You know, some questionable reason. Ones don't talk about it so much. I've heard different perspectives of it, but I'm not going to say it was this reason or that reason. But basically, his his father his family was kicked out right he had a puerto rican mother now nothing against puerto ricans or puerto rican mothers so forth and so on but if you really listen to dr um ben right as he speaks on these issues from what he wrote earlier in the book that we point out to his later later years and then also what dick gregory there's a wonderful audio dick gregory did about i think puerto rico and he shows that within the space of about less than 50 years, there was a whole racial and economic financial shift among Puerto Rico. It's almost like they went from black, right, being more black 
to being less black. They went from being richer and the bankers, the Puerto Rican bankers, talking about like things that happened in, in, in recent history, right? Recent history. And then we have to recognize that a lot of our peoples, right, in the captivities over here, you know, what's the saying among Yehudi and Jews, even we the black Jews, right? You're a Jew if your mother is a Jew. Have you heard about that? If your matriarch is a Jew? So the question is, was his Puerto Rican mother a Jew? How did he raise him? See, some of y'all don't know that there's a certain standards that we are to have in our covenant community. You know what I mean? This is the same thing that we see different cultures around the world. We one time look at Ethiopia and, and, and Africa and other places around the world and, you know, Far East and Asia and people have different customs and culture, right? And people hold to things. You know what I mean? Like even many of the Asians and the Chinese today, they might be in a Western, but some of them, some of them are atheists or don't believe, but they have certain cultural traditions, even among the Japanese and different people, they have cultural traditions that they keep to. Did Dr. Ben do these things? Was he exposed to these things even as a child? Right? One thing we know based on that, that, that lecture, at the beginning of the lecture, he says... Um, I think mean, he says, yeah, he says, Tenai uh, Stalin is the only word. I think, yeah, he, yeah, he says it's the only word. I was just thinking back on that clip. It was a while ago. The only word that he know in them heart. I said, well, actually, when I watched the video, that part of the video, I said out loud, I said, actually, those are two words. But the part that I had to rewind again and listen to it again, I said, wait. He, he says, I'm like, Tenai Stalin. And, and, you know, people, they, they responded, they felt the energy of the word, you know, like in ancient Egypt, they have a thing called the opening of the mouth, right? Where the dead, you know, we spoke about the dead, right? You know, slave, you know, it'd be better to be dead, right? Than to be a slave, enslaved. But once not just enslaved physically, yes, our people went through a lot of physical slavery initially, but later on psycho spiritual slavery. But what about the slavery Right. Of ones like even Dr. Ben, the fact that he did not have the opening of the mouth. I'm talking about to take one to the higher level, like he took ones to the level like of introducing right, a perspective right, that we didn't see. In other words, causing us to see. Right. You know, causing us to see, you know, look at this, look at this, taking ones on tour. Look at this. Look at this. Right. You know, causing us to even hear about the ancient works, right? Like, but the real opening of the mouth, the language and the linguistics, and then for him to say later on in his later years. So he said a lot of things in his later years that are controversial, right? This controversial to the Kemetic community. You know, we were debating whether we're going to talk about this aspect because basically one thing that we basically seek to really emphasize as we mentioned before, and we'd like to mention again, right, is his book, right? This is one thing we'd like to emphasize right here. We want to keep this video, you know, and this vlog right here to the point of this book, why this book is very important for Hebrew Israelites, for we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, the royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews, and all who ascribe, all who are black people and who ascribe, Right. Even if you are so-called black, especially if you're so-called black Christian. Right. This book is very important. Right. Because this book now tells us that it's not as we have been made to believe. It's not like the make believe. Right. Yes, there are, you know, black Jews. Right. But they are black Jews from the very beginning. Right. We're talking about the heritage. And they're also white Jews later on. There's other books as well that are written by those in the Jewish community, you know? So what he did is write a book for us in the black Jewish community. And notice, he never repealed this book. He never debunked the book. All he did was say his opinion that black Jews or people say they're black Jews or they're African Jews or African Israelites and they feel proud about that. You ain't shit is basically what he said. That's basically what he says in, in that particular video up there on the YouTube. That's what he says in that particular video. Now we're going to have to search out that video because when Sinanda played it to dismiss what uh, 
uh, JJ7000, right? He was playing a little bit of this audio. The video is called Dr. Yosef Ben Johanan, right? We the Black Jews, right? We the Black. He goes into a whole reasoning, a whole lecture on that. And basically what he connects is the historical narrative. He never dismissed the fact that there are black Jews, right? And that Israel is black, right? And that Israel really exists. But you see what he was doing on one hand, Dr. Ben, what he was doing on one hand, right? As you can see in the subtitle of this particular book right here, the subtitle of this particular book is Witness to the White Jewish Race Myth. You got to remember the times that these books were compiled and written and published in right? What they were to counteract. You know, we look at a book 50, 100 years later or hundreds of years later, and many times we forget totally about the time that it was written or the mind it was written. What purpose was it for? This book was to basically substantiate on the record, right, that being black and being Jewish Right. And from a Dr. Ben point of view, like later on being comedic or connecting with ancient Egypt is not connecting with a culture outside of black people, but is in essence connecting with ancient black culture. Right. However, Dr. Ben was stating right from his 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 pulpit of being like a comedicist is that it was ancient Egypt was far older. He was talking about what is older, but point of principle, older is not always better, right? Even the scripture tells us that Israel, right, came along long after, right, Yahuwah, right, Eloheinu had created all other nations and before, you know, after there were great nations. We know that we was not the first of all, no, we was chosen Right, out of other peoples, the same, same situation as we as black people in this Americas, black America in the Caribbean, the black Caribbean, right? And, and South and Central, well, the Americas include, you know, South and Central America as well, who have this 400 year experience, right? That matches up and lines up, right? With the prophecies, right? In the scripture. Yeah, a lot of people want to argue against that, right? But what really cut them is this particular book right here because their great comedic teacher, right, put together facts that in spite of him saying that I'm not a practicing, there's many non-practicing European or white Jews, right, that still identify themselves and identified as Jews, right, who don't practice Judaism or who are not, you know, Haredi, Haredi, they're not Da'ati, you know, they're not, they're not religious Jews, they're not Orthodox Jews, they're not ultra-Orthodox Jews, they basically identify themselves as secular Jews. And in the, their own community of white Jews, they have their back and forth too, right? So this might seem so unique, seeing that we say we, the black Jews of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Rastafari Jews, Rastafari Israelite, Rastafari Hebrews, yes I, Rastafari, you know, we identify with that man who is assigned in the seal, Gurmawi Kermah Hadassalasi, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, right? But we're also identifying with this heritage, right? When we say Christ in his kingly character, points to the Ethiopic book of Enoch, right? Not speaking of the Messiah in that first advent, right? The Messiah, son of the woman, right? The Messiah of the parables, but in that second advent, where there'll be this rise of consciousness and we see this from 1892 right and also in our black hebrew heritage and israelite heritage and black jew heritage here in these here north country we also have um william saunders crowdy also i think around that same time that same date is very significant right 1892 right we can even get into the you know astrological science of it too you know, because the word says that there'll be signs in heaven, right? And these signs, how they connect, right, with ancient signs. So from a scientific point of view, this can be proven when we talk about prophecies, not just speaking about something that's going to happen or what ones think is going to happen, but we're talking about what has already happened. But here's the key thing. Who did it happen to? Right? And they say it would happen to everybody in the world. 
You know what I mean? Like everybody can have bad times, but some people have really, really bad times. And it seems like time after time, they have these bad times. Now, if somebody said, well, you are going to have very bad time, time after time. And other people have bad times, you know, sometimes, but you have it seeming all the time. Who do you think that prophecy is meant for? <laughs> but it's not just based on the prophecy, right? It's not just based on the prophecy. Man is a trinity. Man is spirit, right? Soul and a carbon organic structure known as a body, right? So, so spirit and mind, we have to use the logic, the logos, right? So on the logical level, you know what I mean? Because the myth... What's called myth, right, has an element of reality to it, right, for those who can be on code and those who can see it. Notice in ancient Egypt, the dead had to be able to open their mouth, right? Opening the mouth is speaking in the language. Dr. Ben admitted that basically he's a historian, right? He's a historian. He uses his wit, as it says right here, humor, common sense, right, to accent history. See, he can accent history, but he can accent language. Remember, this book was actually written and published under his auspices, under his, you know, authority. I was going to talk about when he was, you know, when he passed away, right? What kind of funeral did he have? Did he have a Christian funeral? Did he have a Jewish funeral? Was he embalmed? Right? This is not to ridicule him. I'm just pointing out how what you kind of sow and the reaping, in a sense. He dismissed totally Right, his 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 Jewish because he said he's not a Jew. He's not he, he you know he's not like a practice. He was born this way, but he's not practicing. Don't believe in the in the so-called religious aspects of it. Okay, okay. Can a man who is a Jew or Ju Judaic or Israelite or come from that seed not practice? We see this with Esau and Jacob. Right, we see this with Esau and Jacob. Right. I use that as an example. They came from one womb, right? They came from one womb. We also see with, with Joseph, where his brothers went against him, right? And sold him, you know, Joseph. And that's Joseph right there. But nobody, who, who sold him, right? Who sold him? What happened to him, right? He exposes historical distortions. So basically what he does, he goes over, he had access to the scholarship, scholarship that we black people, Right in the streets, in the streets, and and elsewhere, the highways and byways didn't have access to. Right, he has taught on the faculty of colleges, universities in the United States and abroad. Right, his most recent assignment was as senior lecturer. Right, faculty of languages. Notice this. Faculty of languages. But clearly, he admitted that he wasn't raised with a knowledge of the Torah, right? Did he have a bar mitzvah? See, I mention these things because it shows his secular approach to his heritage and culture, right? In other words, what has gone on in the world, right? What has recorded in the world. And what he did for us and we, the black Jews, is record, grab all of the historical information available to him, compile it in one volume, and he gave his own, you could say, his own um, wit, humor, common sense. He accented the history, you know, and exposed. He was exposing, right, the white Jewish race myth, right? And then in the video, right, that ones may want to point to where he says, well, if you black Jewish or all your black Jewish and African Jewish, you ain't shit. You know, whether you this or that, because he's saying, let's go all the way back to ancient Egypt and ancient Kemet, that then later on, he would say, nobody has even deciphered. And that became a big question of consternation in the house of consciousness, you know, Sinaitic community, you know, and all. it became a big, a big, um, you know, it was like, is, is this true? Did he say this? Nobody could really answer it because somehow that had gotten under the radar. And then when Cyrus Sudan Seti and young Pharaoh had exposed that, it was like, what, what? Well, well, you see what he said, you know, and they started to like do a lot of different type of explanations, but it was still clear that he was asserting that no one, not even himself, he admitted that he himself truly could not 
you know, did not know the language, was not a linguist. So it's kind of interesting that he 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 had an assignment, his most recent assignment as senior lecturer, like a speaker, right, at the Faculty of Languages Al Azhar University, the Arab Republic of Egypt, right? So he was able to work with them peoples, right, over there. You know, he was able to work with them peoples. Now we have to look, kind of go for some of his ancient Egypt research and see how critical were, were, was he. he. He was to a degree, but he couldn't be so, so much so. You know, because remember that part of touring to Egypt and taking people there on tours and seeing things. This was a part of, you could say, his business. But prior to that, he served as a junk professor of history and Egyptology at Cornell University's Africana Studies Research Center. So he brought to, enough to light. He brought a lot to light concerning ancient Egypt. We don't dismiss his ancient Egypt um, lecturing, you know, but as to say on some levels, we know that he is relying on others who claimed, right, and demonstrated that they were translating but then he said that no one really knew the translation thereof, right? Which now kind of throws everything in a reverse motion. You know what I mean? It's almost like the water goes away from the shore and now it comes back. This creates a kind of tsunami in a sense, intellectually, among the Kemetites. You know, you know our Kemetic brothers and pro-black Egypt, you know, and we don't say that Egypt wasn't black. We say, yes, the root of that was from Ethiopia. We said that the hidden part of it is the Ethiopian equation. And Dr. Ben was like a first sign that we need to go in that direction. And in some cases, we need to go beyond Right, getting beyond Dr. Ben, right? Dr. Ben, from a black Jewish perspective, who was an apostate, he, he fell off, right? But I'm not saying he fell off because he had a bad intent or whatever. I look at it to various factors, as we mentioned. He did not know the language. He was not brought up, you know, in the, in, in the culture. Right. It could be also, you know, you're a Jew if your mother's a Jew to say that you will be more faithful to certain traditions. Like a lot of us, even as black Christians. Right. And our mothers, if they're very Christian or the woman in our family are very Christian and expose us to that. Right. We may not agree with certain things. Right. And we might not even hold to certain things. Right. But we always defer. Right. And humble. Right. Right. To the mother. Right? That's why it says in the word Robano, I and I rabbi, the rabbi of rabbis, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaNotri. Right? What does he say? Yeshua HaMoshe, what does he say? He said, wisdom is justified. Yes, she is by all of her children. Right? So there's a, we will deflect to that. So what role did having a non-Jewish, was his mother Jewish? She was Puerto Rican, but was she Jewish? Right? What was her connection? So, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. This is one reason why even in Torah, right, it seems to be an emphasis, right, on who is the mother. Not just on where she's from or what is her nationality, but also what is her spirituality, right? There are great examples of the matriarch and what one might call the divine feminine in the Bible. Right. And in the Bible, along the side of what we will call the faith of the Hebrews, right, later on to be called Judaism, right, amongst the children of Israel. Right. So this book right here proves that we black people right here in the market. I'm not saying all all black people because they, they took a lot of people from different places. But there is a strong denominator of us here in here in the Americas who are the black Jews of the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So Dr. Ben, right here, he introduces us, right? He introduces us to this within this particular book. Later on, he has his own opinion about other black Jews and black Israelites or African Israelites who are proud of this. And he basically says to, 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 to them and us, basically, that we ain't shit you know, for that pride or whatever. You know, on a certain level, the Apostle Paul would tell you the same thing in the Bible. The Apostle Paul says the same thing for a little different reasons. We know Paul understood the Hebrew. Paul was brought up, you know, with that discipline, right? So in a sense, Dr. Ben did not have that, that black Jewish discipline, 
but he recognized the truth, right? The facts still remain. The facts that he pointed out in this book still remain as historical facts. He's talking about things that happened, right, in a period of time that most of us who identify as Hebrews and Israelites would know nothing about. So it's a great resource why this book is so important. It's a great reference and a resource. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the man so much here. Here we're talking about the message, right? There's a great message that came through this man. You know, and this is why, you know, we could say a love and an honor, right? And we're not to abhor, right, our brother, right? right? You know, our brother, love and honor, right? Here in the dedication says this aspect of the history and heritage of the, quote, black Jews, right? And see, in this book, usually when you hear black Jews out there in the academic world, in the academic world, when they say black Jews, they usually mean the black Jews of Ethiopia. They're talking about the Beta Israel, as the people call them, so the Beta Israel, or the Falasha. Falashas, and then they have other terminology built up on that Falasha, Mora, so forth and so on, right? Now, when we say the black Jews, we say the black Jews uh, here in the West of the line of the tribe of Judah and that particular link with Ethiopia, right, as a pivotal point, And as the black Jews of Harlem said, with Haile Selassie I as the king of Israel, right, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah on the throne of David. So we're just pointing to the reality Right, of what is in the scripture and the Bible as a continuing reality. Right? Yes, there's a level of mythos. Yes, there's an allegorical level. Yes, there is the, the proverbs, the hard sayings, the dark sayings. But to decode those things, we need to have the language. This is why the gift of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was the gift of tongues. Think about it for a moment. This is also one of the reasons why, no doubt, the Apostle Paul right, was brought forward. Right? But when it says this aspect of the history and heritage of the black Jews is dedicated to all oppressed African people whose religion differs from those who control the power of life and death over most of us. Out of this, it is hoped that a better understanding between African people will prevail in spite of our religious differences. This is the whole point right here. So even when he burnt out, as one can say, or say if black Jews, all you proud as black Jews or African Israelites or African Jews, you ain't shit. You know what I mean? In other words, just being proud of that heritage. That's why we say on that point, he's like the Apostle Paul. Paul, who one time was for them, he went against some of his people because he saw their hypocrisy or their lack of moving forward because somewhere along the line, the movement that he outlines, right, in We the Black Jews seemed to have dissipated. The interest in it seems to have fizzled, even though I think he was part of the process of that because if he knew, if he was brought up, like he says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he would not depart from it. Dr. Ben obviously was not trained up in this way. So here is an important lesson for us, right? This was a great man, right? Who was able to do great things, right? But on a certain level, it was only like, it's like the natural man mentioned in the scripture, the psychicos man mentioned in the scripture. You know, he can be, you know, he can be conversant, you know, he can be witty, he can be wise, and all of that. But pertaining to the spiritual truths of the Bible, the spiritual truths of the Torah, right? Like the natural man, he's a sukkakos or the psychicos man, right? The natural man, you know, the basic man, the basic Adam, right? May be learnt, right? Dr. Ben was what? He was learnt, right? He was a scholar, a very wise and a witty man, right? He was learnt. Right. He was gentle. Right. He was eloquent. Right. He was fascinating. But the spiritual content of scripture, right, of the Torah, of the scripture, right, was absolutely hidden from him. But now pertaining to the things of the world or the natural, the basic things, right, he was, you could say, a genius. You know what I mean? And he touched on many points of fact. Now, one has to be able to discern right, his, his revealing of the, of the evidence, the evidence that he brings forward, right, and his own subjective views. He inserted a lot of his subjective views in what he brought forward, 
right? And many ones take to his subjective views because, as it says, he was witty, he was humorous, he had a kind of a common sense, he could accent history, but he cannot accent the language or accent the words. He cannot bring that forward. And on his naturally, he was a black Jew from that seed, that heritage, the Beta Israel of Ethiopia. He was a black Jew. You know what I mean? But spiritually, the content of scripture was absolutely hidden from him. How, how was he brought up? Because many ones who are either Hispanic or Puerto Rican, you know, the Catholicism has a strong role. And if you know the history of Catholicism vis-a-vis -vis other black Jews of Europe, you could go wonder, you go figure. You know, this is why sometimes we refer to Dr. Ben as like, he's a crypto Jew, right? He's kind of a hidden Jew. He's a Jew, right? But what's hidden part of him is the content, the spiritual content of the scripture, you know, the spiritual content of the scripture. So you have to understand the different kinds of man, even scripturally. And what we're pointing to right here is something that our brother Rabbi Shaul, the apostle to the Gentiles, my the apostle to the Gentiles, um, Paul, Paulos, Paulo said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 14, why right? the revealed things are spiritually discerned. He did not have that spiritual discernment. You know, he, he, if he did have that spiritual discernment, he still would have been a great teacher of Kemet, right? But he would have been able to teach more. All he did in this particular book was compile, right, and give his interpretation or his subjective views on certain things or connect what he witnessed like a testimony on certain things. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of Elohim, of Hilehim, of the almighty power, of the nature of natures, to put in language that some of you comedics might be able to understand, Hilehim, the nature of natures, for they are foolishness to him. Right. So when ones bring, you know, the spiritual, uh, you know, elements of scripture or Bible, their foolishness to him. The first thing he's going to do is to try to find some natural historical reference on something that was carved in the walls or written in a papyrus. Right. For they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually. How are they discerned? They are spiritually discerned. Right. He had a very good use of his senses, you know, to the five senses. Right. He was like the scripture called the Adamic man, the unrenewed, unregenerated man. He was not regenerated through the new birth. When I say the new birth, I'm not even talking about Christianity because most true things in Christianity come from Yehudinet, come from Judaism. And I'm talking about the black Judaism, right, of the apocryphal times that come into the New Testament times. He did not even receive, did he receive a bar mitzvah? I must say a bar mitzvah. I'm talking about not just a ceremony because nowadays even European Jews, you know, some still do bring up their children in that discipline. Even if the children later on choose to go out there in the seclorum, they at least have that education, that, that Yehudi, that Jewish education, that Hebrew, that Israelite education. And this is something that modern European Jews do that we can trace all the way back to biblical times, the New Testament times, right? Even in the infancy, the Protovangelion, the ancient scripture that was known to the early Nazarenes, later called Christians, it speak about how even Yeshua, you know, at about like four or so years old, went to a moreh, a more is like a teacher of letters, you know, but because of this spiritual light that was in him, he even was able to teach the teacher concerning the symbolic and the spiritual meaning of the Hebrew Aleph Beit. And notice that most European Jews that do study the Torah or the scripture, they go in it much more deeply, right, than the average Christian. Right? The type of Christian that goes into the Bible that deeply is like the mystic Christian. So there's a different discipline. Right? Even when we look at the Ethiopian and the Beta Israel of Ethiopia and look at some of their traditions, some of their works. How come he never taught us anything about the Beta Israel tradition? I think he told us in some interviews that he was not taught this. 
You know, he was not taught this himself because of things that was going on, you know, with his father and with, you know, his father's exile from from the, you know, from the holy Ethiopia. Why was he exiled? You know, that sounds like a kind of a cane move, you know what I mean? But this is not to disparage him. This is just to look at the facts in context. So once again, this is a very, very important book right here. You know, we can build a little bit more on it, but we want to give just a kind of a general overview. You know, we say it's one of the best books. We the black Jews, you know, we the black Jews, you know, truth. Well, we get we get we get truth here. Right, truth and facts. Right. We get facts here. Right. From an apostate. Right. Or as others may say, from a secular Jew. Right. He was a he was a secular black Jew. Right. Truth from a secular black Jew. We can put it that in that sense. You know, another way for for the more faithful Torah observant. You know, this would be like you know, he's an apostate. He, you know, he had fell off. But his falling off. Right. We say based on what we have seen in the evidence. You know, what I mean, we interpret that his falling off was because like. You know, if you don't put nothing in, you can't get nothing out because he did not have that access, right? So he dismissed it just as religion, that though he's a black Jew, it's just a, a, another, another religion, right? He didn't understand the deeper aspects of the heritage, right? And also he dismissed it because when he looked at the comedic heritage and tradition that he was studying and had access to, right, it was well older. But if he was able to study the Torah, the Torah already tells us, right, the Torah already makes that very clear, you know, makes that very clear that Israel was not the first of the nations. In fact, the Exodus was like the birth of the nation of Israel, the birth of the nation Israel. They were a people, and yes, they were influenced by Kemet, Right. Just as we've been influenced by America, you know, we go to Africa now as so-called black Americans. You know, we say forget about America, the white man, so forth and so on. And that would be like trying to run from realities. What does Matthew say? You know, a misunderstanding of realities. Right. So even Dr. Ben from his youth, he had a misunderstanding of the black Jewish reality. I'm talking about in its spiritual fullness. We talk about the spiritual fullness or the figurative fullness, the allegorical fullness. He reveals to us a very important thing that's important in this academic argument. And the academic argument here would focus on the historical relevance. Now, if we put the Israelite history side by side with the ancient Egyptian history or Kemetic history, Smai Tawi, Tameri history, well, of course, ancient Egypt is older, Babylonian is older, Assyria, you know, is older, all these other ones, all these other ites are older. Even Adam, in a sense, is older than Israel because Adam in even the biblical narrative. But what does that mean? Does that mean that because we today are younger than all of our ancestors that lived before us, that there's no relevance to our life? There's no relevance to our revelation. And see, here is where the, the illogical reasoning is going to bite ones like a serpent, right? By dismissing, you know, dismissing, say, something because it, on one hand, ones would dismiss, you know, the Bible and all of this and that and say, well, we have to do something right now. Yet in the, that's a misunderstanding of reality. See, the misunderstanding of reality is that a baby born right now is born into the reality that has been shaped by that which was before. And ancient peoples, by and large, had a limited understanding of what was before. But their scribes, their priests, the rulers, the ones who had a duty and a responsibility for society, they were taught these things because they had to understand that there was nothing new under the sun. Right? This is why when the Moshia said to the scribes and Pharisees, said that, that, that y'all have the keys, right? y'all have the, you know, the keys you know, of the kingdom, you know? and it was in the scripts, but you don't really reveal what's in those scriptures or scrolls. Dr. Ben, from the academic perspective, was different. 
he basically was up in those universities and he was revealing stuff. Even in this particular book, We the Black Jews, Witness to the White Jewish Race Myth, he revealed evidence here right, that we would not have known an important historical evidence that bridges the gap my, the gap from, say, the early turn of the century, from biblical times, actually, and even through comedic times. My, he even shows us that, that the Hebrews and the Israelites and the people that are identifiable with them, you know, were there. You know, he shows that. You know what I mean? What he's basically maintaining is not like the white man made us believe. The white man tried to make believe, you know, and make us believe that, you know, that like the Bible was first, right? Any Hebrew and Israelite that really understand, I mean, if you really got the basic, you know, 411, the basic 101, you recognize that's not a true view. So the real Israelite or Hebrew perspective and we the black Jews perspective, we, we're not seeking to, to continue in a misunderstanding of realities, but putting the realities into the historical context, right? So yes, before we the black Jews or before uh, the nation of Israel, it was, it was the other nations such as Mitzrayim, such as the Mitzrayim and Mitzrayim. They were before, right? You know, and there's a relationship, as we mentioned, that even our language, this is why I kept harping on language with Dr. Ben. I was shocked. I was surprised when Dr. Ben said, you know, what he said, you know, that that is the only word or so that he knows in, you know, in, in, in Amharic, the language of Ethiopia. Right now, you have to ask yourself, why is that the only language he knows? And then a question is, did he know Hebrew? Did he know any Hebrew? Did he know any Gutters? And then the next question you have to ask is, well, how come, right, he says, what's the truth to what he says about nobody has deciphered the, the Metuneta, the Metuneta, in other words, the sacred language of ancient Egypt. Yet he is a lecturer, right, a scholar. What does it say right up here? He's a scholar, a lecturer. What's the titles that he is given? He is a senior, yes, senior lecturer, right? He was a junk professor. So he's a professor, right, at these universities. Would the universities maintain that view, right? We know that there's the book of the so-called dead or the Pur Im Heru and that this was translated. Is he dismissing that? Does, did he know how to read that? And in the Egyptian context of things, that means that he did not have the opening of the mouth. So he was telling us about dead things. You know what I mean? The dead culture of ancient Egypt, the grave robbers, you know? And to me, that's a tragedy of what went on right there. You know, I wonder how can one's glory in that while still having what they claim to be their ancestral African links in other people's hands, how these people just violated. Notice that the Bible kept Egypt's memory alive until they started to grave rob. Right. Think about that. Right. And even the Bible says, don't disturb the resting place of the landmarks. Right. So you can't put that on us right there. But now that it's known, right, it's before us. You know, we should study it, study it in context. Remember, what does Dr. Ben say right here? This is Yosef A.A. A., right. Ben Yohanan. Right. A.A. A., right. What does A.A. A. stand for? <laughs> Religion is nothing more or less than a belief and that any of and that any one of them is as godly as another this is just the words of Yosef a a ben jockinen right you know a very wise witty learnt you know man eloquent you know witty you know man but notice this too you know gentle as well but notice this too all right that in spite of these things, the spiritual content, right? Even on a certain level, right? The spiritual content of ancient Kemet was not really understood, only by comparison. Notice this, that a lot of our scholars or those who claim to be scholars, when they usually try to promote Kemet, they always use the Bible as a comparison, right? Without giving credit to the Bible for being a kind of a, prompting or inspiration to even the European, right, to grave rob, 
Yeah, I'm going to put it like that. The Bible doesn't say to grave rob. It says don't disturb that. Right. But we know that the white man got into a lot of things and he has shown his his hypocrisy to all and sundry. Right. But that's not the point here. The point is right here is to promote this book right here. Right. Dr. Ben's one of his best books. Right. And to give thanks for his his labor, his service. You know, what I mean, there's some things that are kind of a shame. It's a shame that though he didn't believe in these sort of things, that he still got some sort of a Christian burial that he wasn't embalmed right you know he was basically on a certain level he was anti-religious he might talk about things being a spirituality you know but he dismissed his own heritage and culture right and then the culture that he promoted he wasn't even embalmed or anything like that you know what i mean i would think if that meant something to him you know it's just, it's just one of those curiosity does not make his work less Right or, or more. It's just in reviewing this right here. Would love to be able to have asked him that in his best state of mind, right? And to hear his wit, hear his humor, right? His his learnedness, his his eloquence. You know. Also, he had a, a gentleness of spirit, but he was very subjective, and part of that subjectiveness was based on him, right? He if he was a man that was brought up in his culture. Right. And, and the spiritual traditions. Right. No doubt. Right. He would not have said these things that he had said later on. Right. On that level. And if he did say that, he would have said that in a better context. But more than all of that, he would have been able to bring out more both on the comedic side and on the we could say the black Jew or the Israelite side. But in spite of all that, we should be grateful and thankful to the work that we have. This is basically to say that we, the black Jews, right, is still valid. This book is, is highly valid in spite of Dr. Ben Yohannan's, in spite of some of his own personal views and secular views. See, you all have to be able to distinguish, right, like when a scholar is giving you the facts, right, and direct interpretation of the facts, and then when they're giving you their subjective, right? I'm seeking to point out some facts here. And I'm seeking to keep my subjective view because my subjective view is a little bit harsher on Dr. Ben because I think it's important, you know, like you're, you're a Jew if your mother's a Jew. So so we have a strike right there. And that kind of was a setup from the get up. You know, as we would say, that was a setup from the get up, you know, from the matrix, you know, from the womb to the tomb. You know, what I mean, unless maybe he, he maybe had married someone right, that could have brought him into his his culture. Because we even see that the other Jews, even nowadays with Judaism, they find it to be very important, especially if they're keeping to what they regard to be that holy or that sacred aspect of their tradition. You know, as you say, keep it in the family, right? And if others come in from outside of the family, we bring them into the family. That means we bring them into the faith and also into the historical, right? Because it's the historical record. Right. That gives us a testimony to our faith. And thus the We the Black Jews book right here, here, here is one such book. Volumes one and two in one book. We will highly recommend ones to get a hard copy. Right. Also, just remembered I was reason for brethren and I said I was going to share. We have a PDF of this as well. Now, the PDF might be a little hard to read. It all depends on how well you know how to use a PDF. You know, it's kind of scanned both pages, open pages. We're not responsible for that, but we, we share around the PDF for ones to get a soft copy read even before the hard copy read.